Welcome back to Inside City Hall. We turn our attention now to the issue of parolees going from prison straight into city homeless shelters. It's a problem that our Courtney Gross highlighted in an in-depth investigation last week. And that sparked yet another round of back and forth between Governor Cuomo and Mayor de Blasio, who were blaming each other for a very old question, which is how to successfully reintegrate inmates back into society. Here now to talk more about this are two experts on New York's prisoner reentry services. Joanne Page is the president and CEO of the Fortune Society. Vincent Giraldi is a former city probation commissioner and now the co-director of the Justice Lab at Columbia University. Thank you both for being here. Good to see you. Um, I'm, I'm trying to uh, pull out one particular I issue here. Uh, in all of the back and forth, what the parole department should be doing, uh, whether it's the city or the state's responsibility, the thing that really bowled me over was the idea that the parole department said that four months from discharge, they start planning reintegration services. Um, which is so far from best practices, from what we know from 20 years of experience um, in, in reentry, that it's just the wrong way to do it, right? I mean, what, what's, what's to, to the outside world, people who don't necessarily know this stuff, it might seem like, hey, four months, six months, let's, let's you know, get the guy his papers and find him a job. There's a lot more to it than that, right? Well, the real issue for people who don't have housing to return to is where do they go? And what we've got in New York is a massive homelessness problem. And for people coming out on parole, there are city and state and federal obstacles, even to the small resources that are available. Mm -hmm. So on the federal level, if you come right out of prison, you are defined as not being homeless. You need to sleep under a bridge or go to a shelter in order to be able to access HUD-funded services. Oh. Okay, transitional housing is vanishing. The three-quarter houses, which had real problems, are being closed down. And when we see people coming out of parole, mm -hmm. they are faced with the shelter as the only place they can go. Fortune Society houses a certain number of parolees, but the funding to run the kind of program we do is not available. So we kind of squeeze them in. Well, yeah, I, mean, I want to talk uh, about the castle in just a minute, but l l let me ask you this. I mean, it seems to me it's a... Um, a any number of risk factors, right, for um, somebody to end up violating their parole and heading back to prison if what you're going to do is put them in a homeless shelter where, in many cases in, in our city, there's no services, there's no real job training of, 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 to, to speak of. The person's just kind of waiting uh, to, to screw up and, and end up back in, in incarceration. Yeah, and, and folks in the homeless shelters are associating with other people who might have had criminal records, which is just all by itself a violation of probation or parole. Mm -hmm. They're kicked out first thing in the morning, they'll come back to late at night, so that's very, that's very sort of transient. If they don't have a job, they don't have anything to do during the day, so they're getting in trouble there. Homeless shelters are places where parolees go to fail. Places like the Castle and Fortune Society are where they go to succeed. And that's not really rocket science. It's not even a money issue. It's just really this, the city and state got to plan this better mm -hmm. for the inevitable bunch of people that we know are going to come out. I, we I, know who's coming out. <laughs> it's I, not I, like well, we don't I mean, know. Based, almost all of them is <laughs> yeah. who's coming out, right, yeah. sooner or later. I, I was under the impression that there were, there were, there were federal resources uh, that were available, that it, this is not a, 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 a money question since we're spending a it's, ton of money on the homeless shelters and all kinds so of other things. So this isn't a money question. We do our work at the castle in less, at less than the shelters cost. But HUD is the primary federal funder. Mm. And they exclude people who are coming right out of institutions. They say they're not homeless. So when we get somebody who served 30 years and is 60 years old and comes out with mental health problems and drug issues, they get put in a place like Bellevue that is full of drugs and full of violence and they run a gauntlet and they may or not may not survive mm. but they're not eligible to go into a hud funded program because they're not defined is, is that something that um it sounds to me like the kind of thing that with um a little bit of close editing of hud regulations could be brought in, in line with common sense well you know if you look at what the city the state and the feds are doing, it all lines up against common sense, it lines up against cost effectiveness, and it lines up as a way of filling up Rikers and making communities less safe. So tell me what, uh, uh, about the castle. What do you think is most, what do you think um, contributes to the success that you have? You have about 60 people there at, on any, any, one at any one time, about 100 pass through in the course of the year, and you're, you're really, really working with them. And right? not only that, we are one of the primary resources that parole wants to use. We were asked by New York State to replicate our reentry housing model in upstate New York, 
and the construction's finishing. We're going to open in November. We do something very simple. We have a very low threshold of requirement. You've got to be homeless and formally incarcerated. We really pretty much don't care what your conviction is. Mm -hmm. So we get people who are excluded because of the kinds of serious convictions they had. Right. Then what we have is an intensive program with intensive services. We call it a service program that includes housing. People are required to be in full-time constructive activity. We do daily drug screening. They're involved in group sessions, individual sessions, mental health services, substance abuse services, and we have an absolute rule of no violence or threat of violence. Mm -hmm. We run one of the safest buildings in New York City with no metal detectors, with front desk people who include short women like myself. <laughs> and we keep a culture of safety that our clients help support. And our community board meets in our house. We're a polling place. We made our corner of Harlem mm -hmm. safer than it was before we is, got there. Is, is that scalable? Is that Oh, absolutely. You have 60 folks. Could you do it with 600? I wouldn't do it with 600. I'd do it with another building with 60 or 70 and another building with uh -huh. 60 and 70. We know everybody. We know them well. Mm -hmm. We love them. We hug them. We talk to them. We hold them really strongly accountable. We expect them to be positive members of our community. If we could get the funding to do it, I would open another castle tomorrow. How do we get them the funding to do it? So the only population that's rising in Rikers Island right now are technical parole violators. We were on, I was on yes. your show last month and we released a study that showed that and they are... People who fail a drug test or right. aren't showing up at their meetings and or something. And are associating like with other people with criminal records, right? So those are sort of three typical ones. And homelessness is a huge risk factor for that. Big time. Mm -hmm. And that's increasing statewide while crime is going down statewide and the number of people on parole is going mm -hmm. down statewide. So we have less crime, fewer people on parole, more people locked up mm -hmm. for technical violations. That's a money pot right there. Right. The mayor said, and I think he's right, that if we got control of this issue, he could close one more jail at Rikers Island. Sure. And that's sure. a lot of What's money. What's ironic <laughs> is we could spend less and do better and make communities safer if what we did Absolutely. was look at models that work for this population and get them right into those places. There's been so much talk about how do we end mass incarceration and so forth. This is a, a critical piece of it, right? Be, or, or else folks are going to just end up going right back on, on technical violations. And they're not just going to end up going right back. They are going right back right now. Mm. Okay. Thank you for um, adding that important piece to this conversation. We'll be talking some more in the future, I hope. Right now, we're going to take a quick break. Straight ahead, we will turn our attention back to tonight's story, the signs that TV star Cynthia Nixon could be preparing to run for governor. I'll be joined by the New York One Wise guys. Stay with us.